Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm really excited to be here among my peers. Before we get started, I would like, I know you have a few opening remarks to say, right? Very little, okay. other than to say thank you and to Moj for uh, that great uh, introduction, setting the stage. I'm thrilled to be here with so many creators and I hope we can have a, a real conversation on any issue that may be on your minds. I'm really anxious to hear from you and uh, I am excited about this afternoon, so thanks a lot. All right, so I think we should get started. I would like to kick it off. Um, my name is Dulce Candy, and I immigrated here to the United States back in 1994 with my mom and my younger sisters. Um, since then, I am really proud to say that I served in the US Army. I also completed a 15-month tour in Iraq. And, yeah. <laughs> And since then, I've become a citizen. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, a wife, and a really proud mom. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, the Supreme Court ruling last week determined that five million immigrants, mothers and fathers living here in the United States might be separated from their families. Many people in my community have reached out to ask, ask precedent, what are you going to do to tackle this issue and make sure that it's fixed once and for all? Well, first, let me say that I think it's heartbreaking what um, the Supreme Court decided, which created so much uncertainty and fear on the uh, minds and hearts of millions of people, as you rightly say. And I think your story is a story about why we are so fortunate to be a magnet for people to come here to pursue their dreams. Uh, not only to come as a child, but to uh, join the military, serve our country, and now be an entrepreneur to create even more opportunity for uh, people to come after you. So here's the, uh, the kind of overview. Um, the court didn't actually strike down the executive actions that President Obama took on these two programs that were really aimed at providing more security for the parents of kids who were American citizens, uh, either by birth or naturalization. Instead, they sent it back for a trial in a lower court. And we don't know, therefore, what the outcome will be. We do know that dreamers were not included, and you were right, uh, Dulce, to say, parents, family members, because dreamers, and if you know any uh, who are still eligible, should go ahead and sign up uh, to have the protection that comes under uh, the uh, authority that the president uh, granted. So here's what I will do. I will do everything I can to make the case that what President Obama did was legal, was precedented. Presidents before him made all kinds of decisions about who, although undocumented, could stay or who should be deported. I think the people who should be deported are people who are violent, who pose a real threat to others. I think everybody else, we should put on a path to citizenship through comprehensive immigration reform. So I have said I'm gonna introduce that. My first 100 days as president, um, not only the right thing to do, but it is who we are. We are a nation of immigrants, and we are a nation that has been really blessed by the talents, skills, and hard work of people who have come from all over the world. I bet all of us uh, have at least some story, if not this generation, past generations, people you know, people in your own families. Uh, so I want us to move toward comprehensive immigration reform because it's also economically beneficial. Uh, we know that the economy would be badly uh, damaged if Donald Trump had his way, and 11 million people were rounded up and deported. Uh, it would be a terrible uh, cost, human, moral, and financial cost, and we can't let anything like that happen. So let's stay on the path of comprehensive immigration reform. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so Raymond Brown right here, he's done some amazing work in the campaign as well, and he's going to be, you know, handling the crowd. Where we dive into the questions. I'm really anxious to dive into the questions. Okay. Um, there, 
there's lots of things that I would love to say, okay. but I want to respond to what's on your minds and answer your questions and uh, really have that kind of conversation, Raymond. Well, I know that we're all very excited to ask you. So who would like to kick us off? I see you right here. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we're very, very fortunate to live in a time where the new reality is that women make up the largest percentage of the educated workforce. And that's amazing, and I'm so proud to be part of that. Um, however, that comes at a price, student loan debt. My question to you <laughs> is, um, is there a way to rebalance this debt and make it so that women like myself that are heavily crippled by debt in the pursuit of higher education can be more meaningful contributors to society, to the economy, can buy a home instead of spending the next 25, 30, 40 years really kind of shackled by the reality of student loan debt. Well, you're absolutely right. It is a huge burden on people, not only young people getting out of uh, college and having borrowed money to pay to get their education, but as you rightly point out, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who are still paying their student debt. It's a terrible uh, burden. So yes, I have a commitment to helping uh, people with debt refinance that debt, get it to a lower interest rate. D do you know what your interest rate is on your debt? Okay. okay. 8.25. <laughs> okay. Well, I, and I think it's important that, I mean, I've met people with interest rates from 7 to 14, and 8 and a quarter percent is a lot higher than what mortgages are going for and what car payments are going for and what the interest rates are in uh, our economy right now. So I have a couple of things. One, we're going to refinance. Two, I want to move as many people as possible into uh, repayment plans so you pay back as a percentage of your income, not a fixed amount based on an interest rate. Today in Denver, I announced that for entrepreneurs, people who are trying to start a business, uh, I want to put a you know, moratorium on any debt repayment for three years so that you can try to get started and get your business underway, and if you at the end of those three years can prove that you're really getting something going and you're employing people, we will move toward forgiving a lot of that debt. I'm interested in young people being able to get into business and take all of your good ideas and become entrepreneurs and innovators. I also want people who are doing national service or public service jobs to have a lot of their debt forgiven. There are a lot of places in this country where we're short on doctors, we're short on nurses, we're short on teachers, we're short on police and firefighters. We need to do more to make it possible for young people to do those kinds of uh, professions. I'm also intent upon putting a date certain for the end of your payments. If you have made your payments, then at the end of 15, 20 years, you should be done. And I think that's so important because otherwise it does interfere with buying a home, starting a business, being able to you know, be freed. And I think it boils down to something I really, uh, really disapprove of, and that is the federal government making money off of lending money to young people to get your education. So I have a big set of ideas that I'm going to be pushing hard as soon as I become president. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I saw that Susie had a question, so oh, he's all yes. teed up with a microphone. And just for everyone else, um, when you ask your question, introduce yourself and then head on in. Hi, I'm Susie. Hi. Uh, so as an individual, I feel helpless whenever I drive by these industrial properties. And I see towers of smoke just flying up into the sky. Me, if I wouldn't go to Chipotle and buy a rice bowl and then go outside and just throw the trash on the floor, there's consequences for me. So I feel like these guys are just doing this stuff and just polluting our world. And here in LA, I just recently moved and it's the pollution here and the smog is ridiculous. What are your thoughts currently on climate control and global warming? Well, I, I think you're, you're right to sort of bring it down to earth, so to speak, and talk about what you see as you're driving you know, down the road. Uh, and there is enough for all of us to do something so that 
instead of anybody feeling powerless, everybody feels empowered to deal with uh, climate change, pollution, smog, all of the challenges that we face. And I think this is clearly one of the biggest problems we face, but it's also one of the biggest opportunities. I really am tired of the debate, which is a phony debate. Uh, climate change is real. It is here. It has to be dealt with. And if I hear another politician or public official say they don't know what to say because they're not a scientist, you know, I'm, I'm just going to yell because go talk to a scientist. Go listen to a scientist. Go learn about what is actually happening to our climate. So there are several things to do. On the sort of macro big scale, I highly applaud President Obama's uh, leadership that led to the Paris Agreement. I worked on that when I was Secretary of State with him. It was not easy to move countries like China and India and others to an agreement where they would commit to uh, decreasing their greenhouse gas emissions. But we have the agreement, now we have to implement it. I also applaud President Obama for taking action when he got stymied by Congress. So you can feel upset and you can get really annoyed because people aren't doing what they should do. And that can last, I hope, no more than you know a couple of minutes. And then you say, okay, what are we gonna do about it? And that's what President Obama did. So we have good rules on gas mileage, on utilities, and on other ways to cut greenhouse gas emissions. I think we have the chance to be the clean, renewable energy superpower of the 21st century. And that means we've got to invest in more jobs in energy efficiency, in clean, renewable energy, in a new electric grid, which is connected up to distribute the energy from wind and solar and other renewable sources. Uh, that would be a great way for us to reduce our emissions, to try to get where we need to, according to the Paris Agreement. And it would put so many people to work, and it would spawn new industries. And we invent a lot of what can be used in terms of technology to deal with greenhouse gas emissions and the overall threat of climate change. We should be making more of those products in America. So the job creation potential for dealing with climate change is really significant. And on an individual level, you know, there's a lot of things that if more people did it, uh, you would see results. And just a few things that come to mind, you know, be careful about your own energy use. Uh, pay attention to how much electricity you're using. Pay attention to how much you're driving. If you have an electric car, more power to you. Uh, do what you can to try to reduce your own uh, carbon load. It's hard. I, you know, I don't know most people are doing something, but maybe not enough, and I include myself in that. But on an individual level, there are things we can do, and then it aggregates. So we need a big picture uh, agenda at the national and international level, and then at the state and local level. And I was in um, uh, uh, Indian, I was in uh, Cincinnati. I was in Cincinnati the other day. Cincinnati is one of the few cities already in our country that are 100% clean energy uh, providing electricity and power for all their city buildings. There are lots of examples like that around the country. And so at the local level, push elected officials, push utilities to try to do more uh, here in order to begin to make an impact. Wow, great, thank you. Raymond, one more. Hi, my name is Philip Wang from Wong Fu Productions. Um, our, our country seems to be more divided than ever in terms of just policy or just how we see just the world and the government. Um, why do you think Donald Trump has gone as far as he has and gained so much support? And what would you say to a Trump supporter? Like, would you be sympathetic? Like, how would you see it from their point of view? That's a great question, Philip. Yeah, I, I am sympathetic to. Um, a lot of the people attracted by Trump's uh, message who are feeling really left out and left behind. Uh, they have lost faith in their government, in the economy, certainly in politics and most other institutions. And they don't know how they're going to um, create, and you all are creators, how they're going to create a better future for themselves. 
So I am not only sympathetic, I'm looking for solutions. I've said to a lot of uh, groups of people as we've moved into this general election campaign uh, against Trump that I understand why people are frustrated and even fearful, but don't look for easy answers and misleading promises that cannot deliver what you're hoping for. The whole slogan, make America great again, is code for go back to the time when a lot of people were not included, including women, including African Americans and Latinos and a lot of other people. Um, go back to a time when there really was more of a hierarchy instead of a democratized economy where people are really working hard to get ahead. We are a future-oriented society. America's always been about the future, and every election has been about the future. So I am determined to say, look, you may not vote for me, Trump supporters. I get that because you really are upset about immigration, or you're upset about trade, or you're upset about you know, the feeling that uh, uh, the, the jobs that you, get, you had that gave you a good living are gone. But let's think about what we're going to do to try to create more opportunities for you, your children, your grandchildren. So I'm very sympathetic to that. I am not sympathetic to the xenophobia, the misogyny, the homophobia, the Islamophobia, and all of the other... Um, you know, sort of dog whistles that Trump uses to create that uh, fervor among uh, a lot of his supporters. So when it comes to economics, we do have to do a better job to create more uh, opportunity and to get incomes rising. Most Americans have not had uh, a raise in 15 years. A lot of Americans haven't recovered from the effects of the Great Recession. So that's real, and I accept that as a real challenge to what we're going to have to do to produce uh, more uh, jobs with rising incomes. The rest of the kind of veiled appeal that uh, he has that included inciting violence, we all saw that, um, that has to be rejected. That is contrary to our values and to how we can get things done as a country. You know, we need to be unified, not divided. We can have differences, I'm sure we do, all of us. Uh, but we can't allow those differences to draw big wedges between us so that we are paralyzed and locked in gridlock, as has been going on uh, far too long in Washington. We've got to roll our sleeves up and get to work, and that's what I'm uh, trying to present. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should head over to this side of the room. What do oh, you yeah, think? Oh, yeah, let's do here. Do we have any questions? All right, we'll come right I over here. I see some one in the front. Okay, we'll do that one. Yeah. Hi, my name is Simone Shepard. Let me just say, as a woman, I am super excited that you will be our future president. Um, I'm gonna just say that. Um, but with that being said, as a young African American, I was a big, I was very interested in everything that Bernie was talking about. So I am going to actually read you a question from one of my followers who also was a big Bernie supporter, okay? So his name is James Knox, and he said, we all witnessed Bernie Sanders overwhelmingly receive the support of a specific minority groups. And most, um, uh, most amazingly, he received the support of youth. What, if anything, did you learn from Bernie Sanders as it pertains to relating to the younger demographic and also ethnic? That's exactly what he said. Okay. Well, first of all, I think um, Senator Sanders ran a terrific campaign, and it was uh, good for the Democratic Party, and it was good for the country. Uh, and I think his uh, passion and his uh, incredible energy in conveying uh, his image of what our country could be and should be uh, was inspiring, and particularly inspiring for young people um, across the country. And I think there are a number of lessons to be uh, drawn, uh, at least from my perspective. One of his biggest um, uh, arguments, and certainly one of the uh, reasons why so many young people supported him, at least that's what they told me, because sometimes they would come to my events and I would talk with them uh, as well, is the idea of free college. And you know, I think 
we have got to do a better job of getting the cost of college down for the vast majority of young people and avoiding debt, like the first woman's question. If we can get the cost down and we can manage to send as many young people to college without having to go into debt, then as I try to clean up the whole debt mess, we won't be putting more people into debt. And that is how I want to uh, take the, the real advocacy that Bernie uh, and his supporters brought around the issue of college and put it into a specific set of uh, objectives that I'm going to advocate for during this campaign. I think his emphasis on inequality is also critically important because we have had uh, an increase in the last uh, 15 years, particularly because of the Great Recession, in inequality. And you know, uh, just as a uh, little factual aside, when my husband was president, we saw the creation of 23 million new jobs, but we also saw, most importantly, incomes went up for everybody, not just people at the top. In fact, the average family income went up 17% in the 90s, and the average African-American family income went up 33%, and we lifted more people out of poverty. So I'm not saying that we closed the income gap, but we were on the right path, and I believe if we had stayed on that path, uh, we would be in a better position today than we are. But what happened, we all know this, uh, the Republicans have a very different philosophy. They came in and cut taxes on the wealthy over and over again, got out of the way of regulating the financial markets and the mortgage markets, and we had this terrible recession. And we were dropped into this deep ditch. And I don't think President Obama gets the credit he deserves for digging us out of the ditch and putting us back on, you know, level ground where we have, you know, we've had 75 straight months of job growth. Now, so therefore I think raising the issue of inequality is really significant and I give Bernie a lot of credit for that and certainly among young people to think and focus about it. And therefore I believe we have to have specific ideas that are in contrast to the usual ideas on the other side of the partisan divide about how we can get that engine going again for more growth and fairness. So the debate, I think, is much broader and deeper than it might have been otherwise, uh, thanks to him. So in general, on, on specific issues and on the overall philosophy uh, that he was you know, so passionate in presenting, I think it's been great to bring so many young people into the political system to make young people feel that, you know what, I can be uh, a decision maker because I can support somebody, I can support their, their views, I can vote, uh, which is really critical because young people notoriously are not turning up to vote in, the big, in a big enough uh, margin. So I'm, I'm excited about you know, having the Democratic Party unified. Yesterday I was in Cincinnati with Elizabeth Warren and both of us talked about you know, the kind of agenda that we think the country needs and you know, a lot of that is in line with the goals that uh, Bernie set, which I agree with. We may have had different ideas about how best to achieve them, but we certainly shared the goals of healthcare for everybody, college that is affordable, dealing with uh, the uh, income inequality and particularly reining in those economic forces and those special interests that have for too long called the shots in Washington. So I think overall uh, we had a great primary and I, I really am proud because we ran a primary based on issues and the other side was running a primary based on insults and at the end of it you couldn't figure out what is it they would do to help you. And Bernie and I had a lot of the same ideas in the same uh, way of you know getting to goals, but then we had different approaches, so we had some good uh, debates about what was the best way to do it. That's what I think an election should be about. So I'm very exactly. excited about it. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have. Oh, okay. Here we go. Hi, Hillary. Hello. I'm William Haynes, also a millennial. I know you like those. I do. <laughs> uh, my mommy is a teacher in Richmond, California, one of those cities where, you know, it's like real bad and dangerous. She teaches the bad kids. And uh, she's been doing it for over 20 years. And I notice 
there are basketball players who make ducats. Way more than my mommy. My mom raises these kids and make no money. What can you as president do about teachers? Well, first of all, thank your mother for you, for oh. me, would you? I um, will. I really appreciate, um, I, I think, you know, l let me just put it into a broader context and then I will zoom in on, on your mother and other teachers, and particularly teachers like your mom who are in uh, school districts and schools that are challenging, to say the least, right? Uh, look, I think we have to reimagine education. I think we are stuck in a uh, mold that doesn't fit our times, doesn't fit your experiences, doesn't fit how you communicate with everyone who follows you. Uh, we need to understand that imagination and creativity are really at the core of a successfully educated person uh, in our country today. So I think you have to start from zero to five. I think you have to start by helping kids uh, get better prepared to be successful in school. And I am adamant that we're gonna do more to actually help prepare kids, early childhood education, universal pre-K, so that when they get to elementary and secondary school, their chances of achieving have gone up. Because 80% of your brain is physically formed by the age of three. So if you've got a mom who's a teacher who was talking, reading, and maybe singing to you, she was building your brain, right? So I want more little kids' brains built, and I'm gonna do everything I can to yes. convince more people, and I hope you all will talk about this, or you know, get folks to uh, you know, be with you to explain why this is important. So then we get to elementary and secondary school, and I believe we have really devalued our teachers. We have not provided the kind of respect, support, and resources that the teachers of this country deserve to have. We often ask teachers who are professionals to teach in circumstances that are unacceptable. The physical uh, facilities are unacceptable. The circumstances that they are facing every day in their classroom make it really hard to teach and for kids to learn. So I want us to start by focusing on the teacher, which is the most important ingredient in a successful education for anybody. And it means that we've got to pay teachers more, and we've got to create more and better environments for teachers to operate in. You know, when I was a young mother, I used to have what I called the Chelsea test, my daughter's name. I'd go to schools all the time, um, first in Arkansas, then around the country. And I would ask myself, would I send Chelsea here? And sometimes the answer was a resounding yes. Even in poor neighborhoods, I found places that had spirit, energy, collaboration. You Walking down the hallway, you just thought, man, something's going on here. But then I'd go into other places, I wouldn't send any child to. And now I'm doing it as a grandmother, thinking about you know my granddaughter and grandson. Everybody in this country who has any influence or power, as a creator, as a public official, as a business executive, whatever it might be, should go to public schools and ask themselves, would I send a child that I loved here? And if the answer is no, there's something wrong with us, not necessarily wrong with the school. And we've got to do more to create uh, the kind of uh, school opportunities that teachers will thrive in, that kids will learn in, and that we can all feel really you know, proud of. And so I want to focus on early childhood and elementary and secondary education. Uh, so that I can get more kids able to chart their own course. Not everybody has to go to college. There are other opportunities out there. But we do want young people to be educated, to be able to communicate, to have a passion, if possible. And that comes from largely their school experience. So we've got to unleash the creativity in schools and support the teachers who are doing that work. Should we go somewhere over here? Sure. Somebody in the front row, maybe? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Chrissy Chambers, and I run a YouTube channel with my beautiful girlfriend, Bria Cam. And in 2015, I came out as one of the first public figures who was a victim of revenge porn. 
and ever since have been trying to pursue justice for myself as well as other victims. Currently, I'm pursuing the first civil lawsuit in the United Kingdom against revenge porn, but unfortunately, we do not yet have a revenge porn law here in the United States. 34 states have laws, but there's no federal law criminalizing revenge porn. And I would like to know, when you're president, what you will do to ensure that there is a federal law passed so that ju justice can be pursued and gotten for victims like myself, where the videos and the links still are online to this day, but because there is no law, there's nothing that I can do. And perpetrators can be held accountable for sexual assault, digital privacy invasion, and this horrible crime that ruined so many people's lives and almost ruined mine. Well, first, <laughs> let me say thank you. You are really brave. And standing up, speaking out, and taking action against the kind of um, behavior that you have experienced is so important, and I really thank you for that. And I will do everything I can as president to try to figure out how we can give victims like you the tools you need and the rest of society should support to be able to protect yourself and by doing so protect others. I will really look to all of you because the bullying online, revenge porn, the kind of cyber stalking that is all too common ruins lives. It leads people to lose their confidence, their belief in themselves, to go into depression, and in some cases, kill themselves. The internet and what you all do as creators is such a gift. It has provided, I mean, I know from the little bit of uh, information I have and the briefing, some of you have kept people alive because you have been able to communicate with a person who was bullied or a young person who was struggling with their sexuality and feeling all alone and you were able to give that person a sense of survival and a feeling they weren't by themselves. So I know that many of you have used your, your channels, your outreach in really positive ways as role models, as interveners in some instances to help. So you have to help me figure out how do we keep the best of everything you're doing and everything that the internet means. And yeah, is there going to be bad stuff and nasty stuff and rotten things that are said? I am exhibit A. I am an expert in this. So yes, I know that. But when it crosses a line, when it becomes so threatening, so dangerous, we have to stop it. So I will do whatever I can to try to help you and help others who have spoken out because you're strong enough not to let yourself remain a victim. A lot of people aren't. And so we've got to help you help them. And I will certainly do everything I can to bring that about. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else maybe on this side, front row? Okay. Just Sorry, really, you are really I'm getting, I know. You're getting your exercise <laughs> yeah, today. That's good. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's an honor to speak to you. My name is Jill Cimarelli, and I wanted to ask you about homelessness. I grew up in the suburbs where I didn't really see any of that, and when I moved here when I was 19, I was shocked by what I saw. I moved straight into Hollywood and walking to school every day. I would see tons of homeless people, and it was devastating to me, and just such a big culture shock to me, and it's such a huge issue in many cities, and especially in Los Angeles. It's just a massive issue, and so I was wondering what you plan to do to help try to get some of those people into a safer environment and hopefully help them get back on their feet. Thanks so much for both noticing and caring uh, and asking about it, because we've had an increase in homelessness in a number of cities around the country, and some of it is due to economic, financial problems. Um, people lose their home, they get evicted. 
I know more about New York than a lot of other places. We have a lot of homeless parents and children, particularly a lot of mothers and children, who because of domestic violence or because of financial setbacks, literally don't have anywhere to live. And they end up in shelters if they're not on the street. And the shelters are often dangerous places for, for them. We also have a lot of untreated, un, even undiagnosed, but certainly uh, a lot of homeless people are on the streets because of mental health challenges. And we don't have enough mental health facilities or treatment to really take them in. And addiction is a big problem for many people who end up homeless. So there are different reasons why somebody is on the streets, but those are three big categories, financial, mental health, addiction. And we have to address all of them. So here are some good things that are happening in different parts of the country. And I want to have a big emphasis on homelessness. And one of the areas is trying to provide supported housing so there is some place to take somebody besides a shelter so that there can be a safe place, preferably an apartment, um, which is hard in big cities because the costs are so great. But we need more subsidized, affordable housing for working people, poor people, and homeless people. And that will be a big emphasis of mine. We also need to recognize that mental health is not separate from every other kind of health. It is a health problem, and it deserves to be treated as such. <clears throat> we haven't done that. You know, we overdid um, warehousing mentally uh, ill people back up until about the 80s, and there were a lot of abuses and a lot of problems with that. And we then deinstitutionalized people with the promise that there would be a lot more community facilities, and we never fulfilled that promise. So you will find that the biggest facilities for caring for the mentally ill in our country are jails and prisons. So instead of providing treatment, we pick somebody up off the street, charge them with something, put them in jail, put them in prison, and they don't get the treatment that they need. So we've got to take a hard look at our whole mental health um, institutions, every one of them from local to uh, federal that we can try to provide. And then the same with addiction. We don't have enough treatment. We don't have enough recovery programs. We don't have enough resources. But there are some good programs that I just want to quickly mention. Um, I was in Reno, Nevada. and. The sheriff's department and Catholic charities came together to say, look, we're picking up people on the streets. For them, it was mostly uh, alcoholism, obviously addiction as well. And we're putting them in jail. We're keeping them a few days. We're putting them back out. And then a month later, we pick them up again. And if they're really sick, they're going to the emergency room. And then they're there for a day or two, and then they're back out. There's got to be a better way. So they joined forces, law enforcement and charity, and built a treatment center and said to people who were picked up, you can go to jail or you can go to this treatment center. And if you go to the treatment center, you have to be willing to get counseling. You have to be willing to be tested every day to make sure you haven't fallen off the wagon. But we'll find a job for you and will keep you for as long as it takes for you to feel like you can get back on your feet. I went to visit there and I met with a lot of the residents and so many of them were formerly homeless people. And a lot of them were veterans. We have a huge problem with veteran homelessness. And they said it was the best opportunity they'd ever been given. And so I think we've got to take these pieces of the puzzle and try to put them together. And we need federal dollars to support state, local, nonprofit, kinds of enterprises because we are ignoring a problem that's getting bigger and bigger and more and more uh, heartbreak and difficulties are going to flow from that. So let's try to deal with the different pieces of it and that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay.
Thank where you. Where we headed. Let's see. Um, I see somebody over here on the front row in the red jumpsuit. Hi, Ms. Clinton. Um, I'm Missy Lynn. And just like Dose, um, I was in the military. I served for eight years, and I'm now a veteran. Um, and so, yes. Thank you. I have the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, but unlike a lot of veterans, they fall short. So, just kind of like to piggyback off of uh, what you just said uh, prior that you would do more to help with the veterans and the uh, dollars, federal dollars. But what about the active duty military members right now? Um, there was a, pro a, a proposed pay cut, and I'm just wondering if you plan on reversing that um, by any means, and then how far are you willing to go to help the veterans? Because I know back in 2002, you voted for the Iraq war, and with all the soldiers that we've lost and all the casualties, I'm just wondering, like, with the mindset that you have now, would you cast that same vote, and if so, what would you do to like help reverse the pay cuts and then also moving forward help take care of the veterans a little bit better? Well, first of all, I don't believe we should be cutting pay for active duty military. And you, you know very well since you served that a lot of the junior enlisted people make so little money they are eligible for food stamps. Think about that. I mean, you volunteer to be part of the American Armed Services and you're paid so little that you are eligible for food stamps. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of active duty families, particularly the young families of the uh, junior enlisted, they supplement their food stamps by going to pantries to get free food. So I, I don't want to see, I want us to provide a, a base of uh, financial support for uh, people in the military and their families that is um, a sign of dignity, respect, and appreciation for your service. And I think with uh, regard to veterans, um, it was interesting because I was at a, uh, a, a terrific tech center in Denver earlier today and I was talking to uh, some of the uh, veterans who are running um, an organization called Patriot Boot Camp trying to uh, help vets get linked up with jobs that will recognize the skills that they have learned in the military. And I was talking with them because, and you, you've had this experience, but when you leave the military, you're supposed to get some kind of transition assistance, and you don't. I mean, really, you've been in the military, you have skills, a lot of civilian employers don't recognize those skills, don't understand how important those skills are. And you basically just get like an hour lecture, like, okay, you know, you're gonna be mustering out, and here's what you get, here's what you're eligible for, here's a bunch of brochures, go read it. I mean, you're nodding, so you've been through that. And that is just not adequate. And part of our, uh, my hope is that we do a much better job helping uh, active duty service members prepare uh, for their life after the service. And I, I think that there's a lot we can do to make sure they know what their benefits are, what they can uh, get in terms of education and the like. So there's a lot more to be done that will support our veterans coming out. I also believe that we've got to fix the problems in the VA. Uh, the VA has a lot of really good services. They're you know, tops in the world in certain areas, but they're not organized for the 21st century. They are not technologically available to a lot of uh, young vets. Uh, but I don't want to see veterans care privatized because I think that would make it even more difficult to access the care you need. So I want to fix what's wrong with the VA, bring it into the 21st century, make sure it has the resources uh, that it needs to serve all of our veterans, and that's exactly what I intend to do as president. Awesome. Thank you. Dulce, I think we should give some love to the middle of the room. Yeah, what do you think? We haven't gotten anybody in the front. Okay. Uh, yellow dress. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Matilda, and uh, being on YouTube, I just have noticed what um, the power of social media and how influential it can be, and obviously I think it's been very influential in your campaign, 
and I'm wondering how you can use it to address issues in our nation and if you see it being powerful for um, your, if you possibly become the President of the United States. Well, great question. Again, I would ask all of you, um, because in many ways you're the experts uh, in this, there's no doubt that social media is a driver of uh, opinions, of commitments, of involvements, and the more we can do that in a campaign, the better it is. And I have a, a terrific team, uh, some of whom are with me today, who work on that every, every minute. Uh, and I want to not only do it during the campaign, but I want to do it uh, in the White House as well, uh, because it would be, I think, really missing a great opportunity not to engage, not to have, like all of you come to the White House and have a conversation about what we can do and how can we do it better and what are the issues on you know, your viewers' uh, minds, how do you figure out what's best to talk about, what can we do? Like going back to the debt question, how do we get information out about helping people uh, pay down that debt and get out from under it? Uh, I, I just think there's a great opportunity, and I hope that uh, we will build on the good work that President Obama's White House has done. I think he has pioneered the use of social media, uh, and particularly during uh, his administration, had people at the White House, went out, was interviewed by people around the country, and tried to drive a message. Uh, one of the most successful messages was getting young people to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. That was a very effective message that was driven on social media by people like yourselves, uh, getting that message out. So the more we can connect with people where they are and meet them where they are, and both because we get good feedback or because we anticipate what questions might be, you know, really always be there delivering that information. I think that's part of uh, being a leader in today's world. Great, thank you. So, so we had, um, we also invited people to ask questions via social media, and I wanted to share a question that personally resonated with me that a lot of people were wondering about. Um, I think like so many LGBTQ people, I was horrified and traumatized by what happened in Orlando, and I had a chance to be on the ground there and talk to people in the wake of what happened, and I think that as a community, we wanna project strength and march proudly forward, but we also are really struggling with feeling safe in our own country, and so, you know, we know that, there, that hate crimes are historically underreported and that there's growing violence against LGBTQ people, particularly our transgender brothers and sisters. And so my question is, as president, what will you do to tackle homophobia and transphobia and keep LGBTQ people safe and all people safe? Thank you. <clears throat> well, Raymond, I think you're expressing the feelings that a lot of people have. And the horrifying events in Orlando, which was both terrorism and a hate crime, uh, just sent shockwaves through America, but the people most affected were those in the LGBT community. You and I were talking briefly before I came out here, and it's one of the reasons why um, I went to the Pride Parade in New York City, because I wanted to demonstrate unequivocally that um, I would do everything I could to deal with homophobia, to deal with the uh, threats, the hate crimes. I mean, this is not new. We have lived with this, as you know. Uh, Stonewall just became a, uh, a national monument, and I was proud to be down there. So I think it is uh, an issue that we have to address on several, on several levels. First, uh, we have to keep standing up against the, uh, the homophobia, the hatred, the disrespecting and demeaning of uh, people that is still much too common uh, in our, uh, our society and unfortunately even in our political uh, system. We need to keep pushing forward on legislation that will uh, put into our laws protections for uh, LGBT people I mean, you can get married on Saturday, you can post your pictures on Sunday, and you can be fired on Monday, because there is no employment protection. And those of you who live in LA, um, wherever else you may have lived before, uh, are in an environment that is you know, not as threatening as what so many people face in 
countless uh, places across our country to say nothing of the world. Uh, so as, as president, I will work to pass the Equality Act. I will work to set a good example of how we are an inclusive country, an inclusive government that looks like America, that includes everybody. And I will continue the work I started as Secretary of State to uh, speak out against uh, discrimination uh, against uh, the LGBT community across the globe. Because I went to Geneva when I was Secretary of State to deliver uh, a very clear message that it was American policy, not just what I was saying personally, but American policy to stand up for the rights of uh, the LGBT community. Uh, and we will keep beating that drum. I started programs to provide funding for activists. You know, there are a lot of people who are scared all the time in other countries, and I don't want people to be scared in our country. I don't want what happened at Pulse to infect people with that level of fear. Uh, it was a, a horrible, terrible, I can't even think of all the adjectives that describe the shock and distress that we all felt, but I don't want people to live in fear. And it is something that we have to do more to provide the protection and the safety and the legal uh, you know, support for you to uh, not feel that way. I can't, I can't stop every hate crime. Uh, I wish I could. And I'm working as hard as I can to keep guns out of the wrong hands, something that I think contributed uh, to the uh, murders uh, in Orlando. And the idea that we can't do more to protect people from the epidemic of gun violence is just uh, so heart sickening to me that I, I'm going to stay on this, take on the gun lobby, keep fighting uh, for gun safety measures. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for releasing the most comprehensive platform from the LGBT community of any uh, candidate. It really means so much to me and so many others. Dulce, I got word that we have time for one more question, so I will okay, let you do the honors. More. Okay, let's see someone from this side. I'll see the lady in the back row, please. Hi, Mrs. Clinton, how are you? Okay, thank you, Dulce. I have a question for you. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have to respectfully ask you this question from my community and also for myself. And I'm nervous to do so. <laughs> You've garnered a lot of mistrust from the black community based on unfortunate and detrimental past events. You can just look through the comments on my Instagram post about this event and see for yourself. So I would like to know, what are your concrete plans to win back the trust of black America, as you know and respectfully have been involved in systematic racism is a real problem. If we're to have a united America, we need to admit this publicly and often, and then we need the call to action. We as a people have contributed so much to this country, it was literally built on our backs, but have consistently since creation had the least respect. And I know everyone's tired of hearing about this issue, but trust us, we're more tired of having to talk about it. What are your steps to improve that relationship and tradition of negative stereotyping and generalizations of black America for a real united America. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly uh, understand and even agree with what you said about the uh, perpetuation of systemic racism. I've spoken out about that. I have addressed it. I also was very honored to receive a huge percentage of the vote of African Americans in the primary. And I am grateful for that because so many people know of my history. I don't always uh, talk about it, so I'm not uh, surprised that uh, younger people don't. Uh, but you know, I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund right out of law school. I didn't go to work for a law firm. I went to work for Marion Wright Edelman, a pioneering African American lawyer 
who was uh, by the side of uh, Dr. King and fighting for civil rights, and who created an organization called the Children's Defense Fund to continue that work. I went to South Carolina as a young law student to gather information to end the practice of housing uh, juveniles in adult jails. I went undercover to Alabama to gather information to prevent uh, the creation of tax-exempt status for segregated academies. I worked to further the legal services that were available to poor and um, communities of color who didn't have access to lawyers and were disadvantaged because they couldn't demand their rights uh, for uh, whatever their problem was. I worked to make it possible uh, for uh, more young people to get a good education in Arkansas, which was one of the poorest education uh, systems in our country, to provide uh, greater equality of opportunity and the same with health care. And people who supported me understood that and they knew it. But that doesn't mean that uh, because I have a history of working to try to overcome injustice and systemic challenges like racism, uh, that I don't want to be held accountable by voters because I'm telling you what I want to do. The very first speech that I gave in this campaign a year ago, April, uh, was about criminal justice reform, ending the era of mass incarceration, uh, looking for more programs of diversion, creating more housing, education, and employment opportunities. Uh, when I was a senator from New York, one of the reasons I won New York by 16 points over Bernie Sanders is because I had so much support from across that state because of the work that I had done. So I am more than open to and receptive to dealing with the systemic problems that are at the root of injustice and disunity and inequality in our country. But I also do respectfully ask that people know a little bit more about what I have done and why the Congressional Black Caucus supported me and why other black leaders have supported me because I've been there and I will continue to be there and I hope that we'll make more progress when I am president. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess that's all the time that we have for today. I just want to say thank you so much. I think this was a great opportunity for all of us to start a conversation. But before you leave, we want to know if you are okay with taking a group selfie. Oh God, <laughs> this could be better than the Oscars. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, we have to send it to Ellen and tell her <laughs> that uh, I think we should look all at what we've done here. Then. What do you think? So everybody, if you guys can gather around really, really tight, because if you want to make it in this shot, you got to get personal. OK. Um, I think you can be right next to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you won't.